Um, okay, so before I actually get on to what I'm going to be speaking about, which is critical thinking pedagogies, and I should say also that uh, we don't see in this project a sharp divide between what happens in primary school, secondary school, and higher education. And in fact, the best way to help students succeed in higher education is by, in our humble opinion, <laughs> is by training them in critical and creative thinking from the get-go so that there isn't a sharp divide in the pedagogical approach once they hit university and that there are clear expectations of them that they are, what they're in, embarking on is an endeavour in which they will be expected to make new contributions to knowledge. That has traditionally, since the mid Middle Ages, been the defining characteristic of a university and what divides it from the school sector. And we think it's time that that divide broke down. That's the best way to ensure uh, that you get another generation of knowledge makers coming through who are equipped cognitively and emotionally and in every other respect to undertake the challenges uh, that they will face in coming to university. I'm going to start with a sort of big picture and then move into the small picture around what the critical thinking pedagogy um, that we be, we've been working with involves. So I'm going to start with this idea of a knowledge economy because I think we are at a point now where we are facing unprecedented, unprecedented challenges as educators. We can no longer expect to be able to just transmit the accumulated wisdom of the ages. We are expected to do so many more things for our students to prepare them for this knowledge economy that we're in or we're either hurtling towards. And what a knowledge economy is just is an economic system based around the consumption and production of knowledge. So the measure of, of an economy going forward is going to be um, the extent to which it's able to come up with ideas to meet the challenges and needs as they arise and to anticipate those challenges. And the word that we have for the production of knowledge is thinking, which is why we think you know, we need to take a thinking focus uh, in our education at every level. Now, the school sector has spent a lot of time thinking about 20, 21st century skills and the importance of it. So this is tied to the notion of a knowledge economy, where it's not going to be so much what you know, but how you know that's going to be increasingly important. And so the idea is we need to pre prepare students for these 21st century skills, many of which we can't yet know, we can't even really anticipate. But one thing we do know is whatever those skills are going to be, they're going to have to be highly transferable. So if you look at the nat national education goals for young Australians, or you look at the ACARA documents uh, around general capabilities, critical and creative thinking are listed number one. As the Queensland Curriculum and Assessment Authority position paper on 21st century skills makes clear, students will need more than core subject knowledge. They will need to become lifelong learners and global citizens who create opportunities and are confident in pursuing their passions. Uh, now notice all of the effective language in there as well. And also this idea that that students will need to see themselves as lifelong learners because they will need to, be, to have the flexibility and independence of mind to move across a variety of work uh, and study environments or contexts. Um, so this is a you know, snapshot from the QCAA paper and notice that they have critical and creative thinking side by side. Those are paired concepts. Um, and you know, if you want to see the connection, just think about innovation. There is no innovation which doesn't presuppose an analysis of existing conditions, problem solving, the ability to calculate utilities and make effective decisions, reasoning skills, reflecting and evaluating, and that intellectual flexibility, you know, just not being stuck, thinking that the status quo is going to work forever or is necessarily good, being able to think outside the box. We also are going to have to prepare students who are able to align their individual rationality with their collective rationality. That is to see their individual self-interest as aligned with the common good. You know, we can't persist with this idea that people are going to be able to just pursue their self-interest without any concern for its impacts on others. And we need to be able to instill in students the capacity to work together collaboratively to solve problems because the problems are too big for any one person or one small group of people to solve. And we need to be thinking more about the collective good, both ourselves and also in the students. We have to help students develop what philosophers call 
a set of re reactive attitudes, attitudes that are premised on the assumption that others are persons and so due the moral and legal respect that persons are due, as opposed to objective attitudes, which involve seeing others as objects of social policy, subjects of treatment, and things to be managed. So this is the 21st century question for us as educators. How do we respond? How are we going to achieve all of those outcomes that we're expected to achieve in helping students to become well-rounded citizens to have these 21st century skills and to also be prepared to undertake the challenges that they're going to face in the future. What kinds of you know, virtues do they need in order to, uh, to uh, face those challenges? Uh, and we have to help them in that journey. Now, uh, for us in this project, um, what's fundamental to us as educators enabling those kinds of skills and virtues in students is to see classrooms as sites of public reason. And I'll say in a minute what I mean by public reason, um, but I think uh, first and foremost it's associated with creating space within the curriculum for students to develop a set of virtues and cognitive skills that are associated with this concept. And then we need to think about what kind of teaching practices are best suited to fostering such skills and virtues. And I don't think that these kinds of concerns just pertain to moral philosophy classes, right? These are across the curriculum considerations. So what we mean by public reason is just the idea that public decisions must be made on the basis of reasons accessible to a variety of standpoints. So that if we're coming up with public policies, we need to make sure that they're ones that people can accept or have reasons to accept, irrespective of their standing socially. Right? So we want public policies to be of benefit to those who are the most worse off. Otherwise, we don't have a system of public reason. And this notion of public reason embodies the virtues of fairness and respect. But fairness because each person in their clearly held position is treated equally and respect because each person is bound only to accept those policies that they have grounds for accepting. Okay, now for us to think of classrooms as sites of, of public reason just is to think of the classroom as a thinking classroom. If you transform your classroom into a thinking classroom, you kind of get the virtues of public reason for free. What is a thinking classroom? It's one focused on the development of a range of cognitive but also metacognitive skills, the capacity in students to evaluate their own reasons and their reasoning and to use a language for evaluating their own reasoning. But to create a thinking classroom requires a certain kind of pedagogical approach. It's not going to happen automatically. It actually will take some uh, driving uh, by teachers some pedagogical framework. Now, do we need critical thinking? Well, the psychological literature is, of course, rife with evidence uh, on how we are prone to bias and over-reliance on hasty generalisations and faulty heuristics. Daniel Kahneman has made um, you know, his career uh, studying the difference between um, what he calls system one thinking, which is fast, intuitive and emotional, and system two thinking, which is slow, deliberative and logical. Not that these are mutually exclusive. We know that you, know, you can't reason effectively if your emotion centres of your brain are damaged. Uh, and it's not to say also that the system two thinking is somehow inherently superior. I don't think you could, you know, dodge a you know, cricket ball or get out of bed if you couldn't do system one thinking. Um, but I think Kahneman's message is that we, we often don't engage in the right kind of thinking in the right context. So there are contexts where we need to slow down our thinking, to think about our thinking, to be more deliberative, to think logically, and we don't. We tend to sort of make intuitive judgments uh, and that's where we get ourselves into trouble. And the interesting thing about Kahneman's research is that it's across the board, right? I mean, it, it includes, you know, he's done a lot of studies, uh, including with academics who are prone to such cognitive biases. Um, so it's, it's you know, it, you can't assume that just because you, you know, have a PhD or you go through um, higher education 
that you're going to, by osmosis, develop good habits in system two thinking. But it's not even clear that what Kahneman is defining as system two thinking is enough. Um, so there's been some nice studies which show that my side buys, for example, and that's the tendency to uh, prefer arguments and evidence that support what you already believe. The my side bias doesn't disappear with slower, that is more logical uh, thinking. So even if you've got students who are applying criteria and measuring the strength of an argument, uh, they might still be prone to, um, to various forms of, of bias. <coughs> In a nice study, for example, by McCrudden and Barnes, they gave students a set of arguments, both weak, weak and strong, uh, positive and negative, um, uh, in relation to what the students already believed. So they first of all found out what students believed about climate change, and then they presented them with a number of arguments, both weak and strong, both for and against climate change. And they found that my side bias more or less prevailed when the students were asked to rank these arguments in terms of strength. Now what's interesting about this study is that the students were using system two thinking because they were given a set of criteria and they had a little intervention where they discussed why these were good criteria for evaluating arguments. And then they ranked the arguments, they were able to explain their reasoning relative to the criteria. And yet my side bias prevailed. That is, they were more likely to rank as the most strongest the arguments that agreed with their, or were consistent with their already held beliefs about climate change. Now it's interesting, there were a few students, however, and the number was <laughs> diminishingly small, we're talking about four out of 72, but there were a few students who were able to see that arguments of equal strength um, were both, you know, they were able to measure arguments of equal strength, whether they were belief consistent or belief inconsistent. And McCrudden and Barnes didn't really have a well-developed explanation for this, but they speculate that these students may have understood that beliefs can bias our judgment. They may have guarded against this potential bias by applying evaluation standards uniformly to the arguments independently of their beliefs. And they go further borrowing on some work of Moshman that differences in how belief relevant information is processed might depend on differences in conceptual and procedural metacognition. That is knowledge that prior beliefs bias reasoning and knowledge about how to use this information to be self-regulating. <clears throat> now that's all very speculative and it doesn't, to my mind, uh, quite cut it. Um, first of all, it's not, it's not obvious that students, the students in that position we're using just procedural knowledge, where procedural knowledge might suggest a quick kind of technical fix, as if students just need a set of procedures for working through logical puzzles. And the reason I don't think that's enough is that we know that effective reasoning can't be reduced to logic. I mean, logic does, just tells you what follows from what, right? What's a valid inference given what you already believe? Logic will not tell you what to believe. Right? It won't tell you when you encounter belief in consistent information whether you should revise your beliefs or whether you should reject <laughs> the belief in consistent information or whether you should do some third thing like just withhold assent to any proposition until you get more information. So reasoning is a much more complex process and it involves a very different set of skills from just um, being able to apply logical uh, rules of inference. And also, what they were ignoring in this um, study were the effects of social cognition. I mean, one of the ways in which students are able, and people generally are able to correct for bias, is by testing their ideas in a, in a social context collaboratively with others. I think this, what do you think? Oh, I think there's a problem there. Oh, you might be right. You know, that kind of give and take of reasons, which is fundamental to reasoning and is inherently social. Uh, and isn't a matter of applying procedures. Okay. What you want are students to embody this kind of sentiment. Now, this was a quote from a student, a year 11 student from a low SES school who was participating in our summer uh, critical thinking pro um, and writing program. It's called Effective Thinking and Writing. And it's offered just to low SES and Indigenous students uh, in January of each year. Uh, and here was a student who's asked what she thought about the course as a whole. 
uh, and this just blows me away every time I read it. She says, I learned that it's important to separate yourself from the ideas you are putting forward in an argument and that you should always go into an argument willing to have your perception changed by a better counter-argument. <laughs> now just, I mean, just think about what that quote uh, represents. First of all, this student has the language of argumentation and counter-arguments. She's willing to entertain doubt. She's got this tolerance for doubt and disagreement. She's willing to, to see that perspectives can be changed on the basis of uh, conflicting evidence. And she's got that degree of objectivity from her ideas. She's, I mean, now that to me sums up a very good attitude <laughs> towards the effects of my side bias. But that includes you know, an understanding of what argumentation involves and a whole range of other effective and normative um, dispositions. So to our mind, what's important for students is that they understand not just what it is to be metacognitive, that they have the capacity to reflect on their reasoning, but that they are capable of metacognitive evaluation. They're able to take their reasoning and that of others and subject it to critical scrutiny, and they have the language and the concepts and the resources to do that effectively. So students are asked then to embody norms of reasonableness, including a tolerance for doubt. They need to understand what cogency and argumentation is, what, why consistency is important. They have to be able to identify, construct and evaluate arguments. So how do we, to go back to our original question, how do we create a thinking classroom, one in which these norms and dispositions and capacities for argumentation and cognitive skills and reflection upon one's own reasoning, how do we create such a classroom? This is a pedagogical question. Now, unlike those accounts which emphasise procedural knowledge, um, we emphasise the importance of schematic knowledge. And we require that, or we sort of think it's best, if both educators and students have an understanding of this schematic knowledge. Now, why, why do we prefer schemas over procedures? Well, the main reason is that schemas can effectively bridge theory and practice. If you've got schematic knowledge, you both have a lot of know that, right? <laughs> so you might know what rules of inference um, are best in terms of tracking the truth. Right? You might have that know that, uh, but you also have know how, right? You know, you know how to apply what you know to concrete, create, co concrete cases and be able to engage in that identification, analysis and construction of arguments. So this is what accounts for why it is that critical thinking is such a highly transferable skill, why, why it enables students to transfer their thinking, their effective thinking, across multiple disciplines or classes uh, and even beyond the classroom into everyday life. Schematic knowledge like an engineer's drawing or a grammar of a natural language is essentially transferable. It consists in a partial structural representation of the domain of knowledge being mapped. And in being partial, it enables those who possess, it, possess that knowledge to fill in the schema with a variety of concrete examples. So if, you know, as a speaker of, of English, you, you have the schema for a well-formed sentence in English, namely noun phrase, verb phrase, having that schema enables you to identify well-formed sentences, to produce well-formed sentences of English, and to detect sentences that aren't well formed in English, right, that don't fit the schema. So a schema is a very powerful tool if you have it. And also schematic knowledge is structural. It enables you to understand relations among variables, how they operate and how they inform the processes of inquiry. So we base our program around what we call a pedagogical schema for teaching critical thinking. And the architect of this is my colleague, uh, Peter Ellerton, who couldn't be here today and probably would have been a better person to have up here. <laughs> but Peter is off advising the European Commission on how to embed critical thinking in STEM education. So he's off in Brussels, as you do. So you've got me instead, so I'll do my best. But anyway, but Peter is the architect of the pedagogical schema upon which our project is based. 
And what this schema focuses on are the, the metacognitive skills that are, as we know from Peirce, ampliative. That is, they enable the possessors of them to do more with knowledge than simply recall it, in particular, to generate it. So these skills include things like analysis, synthesis, argumentation, justification, and evaluation. And you know, there's quite a list to them, uh, but those are some of the principal ones. And what we do in this scheme is we align those cognitive skills with values of inquiry. So the matrix that you have picked up at the front, or if you haven't picked up, you can pick up later. Uh, you have the, the cognitive skills down the left-hand side and the values of inquiry across, across the top. So what this uh, matrix enables um, educators to do is to design classroom activities that, uh, in which students will get to explore, develop, apply cognitive skills in the processes of leading their own inquiry. That is the important shift. There has to be space within the curriculum for students to participate in the processes that drive inquiry forward. And some teachers will actually use this matrix. They will take boxes out of the matrix and they'll have them up on the wall and they'll get students in groups to go up and they might give them a piece of text, say, and, and get students to go up and pull one of these boxes off the wall and say, okay, you know, you're, what are you going to do? Oh, you know, I'm going to, do, I'm going to under, try and understand what it is to do analysis well with respect to accuracy or precision or depth or coherence. Uh, and then they might sort of, they'll move around and do other skills um, and do other sort of exercises um, uh, based on other boxes, right? So through this process, I mean, the students are still learning the same content, but suddenly they're engaged as independent learners and as effective inquirers in generating the kinds of questions and lines of inquiry that are involved in understanding the particular content that they've been given or that they're dealing with. And it also enables um, educators to design assessment tasks that will test for those particular skills, you know. So if you, you know, you get some piece of assessment back and you think, my students don't really understand what analysis is, well, you can go to this matrix and you can design an assessment that will test for just that skill, that combination of skills and values of inquiry. Now, it's just a tool. I mean, this is just one thing that we use to assist educators in uh, understanding how to embed critical thinking within their classroom practice. But it's a very effective tool, particularly for teachers who are coming to this pedagogical approach new. So what are the key elements of the pedagogy? First and foremost, it's inclusive. It's a matter of creating space within the curriculum for the student voice, for the student perspective to develop, right? I mean, if we want students who are effective in participating in public reason, they have to have opportunities to develop their own perspectives and also to see how their perspectives might not be exactly aligned with others and to work with that disagreement and that doubt to build to consensus. They have to be given those opportunities within the, within the curriculum. There's a shift of emphasis from content to process, but interestingly, with this pedagogical approach, you don't have to sacrifice content. You use the content as a vehicle for shifting the focus of your teaching onto the development of cognitive and meta metacognitive skills. So it's a way of delivering the curriculum. It's not competing stuff that you as an educator have to master. And well, you have to do some mastery, but you don't have to deliver more stuff. You just deliver your stuff in a somewhat different way. It enables accurate diagnoses of students' cognitive abilities. Right? So if you sit there in the classroom and you really don't have any idea what your students or how your students are thinking, uh, then that should be a sign that something's missing from your pedagogical approach. You need to understand how your students are thinking if you're going to assist them to think better. As I mentioned already, critical thinking is a highly transferable skill. It's possibly the most transferable skill across a range of curricula. So we have you know, teachers in every single discipline using this pedagogy. And finally, it transforms classroom practice towards more open-ended discussion and higher order thinking about foundational context, concepts. 
But that higher order thinking is unpacked for the students. So the students and the teachers will be using the same meta language around analysis, evaluation and so on. They'll understand what those terms mean. So, what, and I should say that the pedagogy is actually very easy to adopt and very easy to implement. So after a two-day professional development program, teachers can kind of go away and say, okay, I know what I'm going to do on Monday morning. And often the first thing they do is they start working with their students uh, on this particular exercise, which um, I think you've got it. one of the handouts was the Q matrix, which is just a question matrix. And you might give the students a topic and the students will start filling in this matrix with a whole bunch of questions. So I say to the students, okay, you go off and work in groups or you know, in pairs, whatever it may be, and generate as many questions as you can within this matrix. Now, the nice thing about this matrix is that as you move from the top left-hand corner, which are all the safe questions like what is, where is, when is, and so on, as you move diagonally down to the right-hand quadrant, the questions become more abstract, more modal, more future oriented. You know, what will be the case, what could be the case, what should be the case, more normative. Now, students are going to sort of fill this in with a whole bunch of questions, some of which may just pop into their heads. Uh, and then you need a mechanism for sifting through these to find out the most relevant questions. So often what a teacher will do using the Q matrix is have the students generate a whole bunch of questions and then break out and say, okay, let's come back to, oh, sorry, not break out, but come back together as a group and say to the students, okay, let's talk about what makes a question significant. So you sort of put the questions aside and you talk about significance or you talk about relevance. And the students will then have an open discussion about what makes a question significant. And they will generate a set of criteria amongst themselves. So this is students you know, basically generating the norms that are going to apply in their own inquiries. And the teacher's there as a facilitator, not as a director. So then once they've settled on their criteria, they then go back to their questions and they sift through and find the ones that meet those criteria best. And that's how the students begin the process of, you know, or begin making their own inquiry. Now here's a little interesting datum, uh, and I should say that it's one that's worthy of, future, of further study, um, because, but I will, I will report it anyway because I just find it so fascinating. So two schools independently have reported to me that when they use this Q matrix in their classroom of students who are on the autism spectrum, that the students gravitate towards the lower right-hand quadrant. <laughs> And this, is, this has come to me from two schools independently, both of whom have high numbers of students on the autism spectrum. So what, you know, from these teachers I'm gathering is that these students are not interested in what is the case, that's what we already know. They are most interested in what could be the case, what should be the case. They're in that sort of abstract modal category. Now it's only two schools and it's, you know, it would need, I think, further study, but it's an interesting uh, example of how teachers can use the Q matrix to understand their, their students' thinking. And those teachers told me that this was revelatory for them. So they understood what they had to do to really engage these students in their own learning. Uh, so they, you know, they started these students, uh, started off doing projects which were about future problem solving. And the students took off. Uh, in terms of their learning and thrived. And I've seen some of the things that they produce, these multimodal presentations, which are just fantastic. Okay, uh, another thing we might do in working with teachers is actually help teachers think about the kinds of questions they design. And in designing questions, it's important to use this language around uh, critical thinking and cognitive skills. Precisely, as we say, precision of language makes for clarity of purpose. So take, for example, uh, this uh, example of a question. Um, discuss the analogy between the electric field of a capacitor and the magnetic field of a solenoid. Um, now, I mean, that, and that's a question that appeared, you know, in a piece of assessment uh, for students. Um, and the students were confused. Uh, and it's not hard to see why they would be confused, because what does discuss imply? Well, in educational context, it would ordinarily imply that 
you are to discuss, you are to do, the students are to, to discuss two sides of a debate and come to a conclusion. But that doesn't quite fit in this case. So maybe, you know, what's needed is a different way of framing the question. Maybe it should be something like this, list two ways in which they are analogous or evaluate the claim that there is an analogy. And notice in that second one, evaluate the claim that there is an analogy between dot, dot, dot. Students have to think about what an analogy is. And the answer they give will either show that they do or don't understand what an analogy is. So that's sort of moving beyond the content to a question designed to bring out how it is they're reasoning uh, and whether they understand what it is to reason well. Oh, a bit of product placement here. One of the things that we find particularly effective is to get students to um, do argument mapping. Uh, and we have to get Dave to wave here <laughs> because Dave is, uh, Dave and, and a couple of us have a uh, teaching innovation grant where we're developing this software and it's going to be open source and available to every, for everyone to use and we'll also help disciplines uh, embedded in their uh, teaching practices. Um, but we find that that argument mapping is a very effective way of helping students to see the logical connection between ideas. Um, if you just, you know, get students to do a map of a piece of text, they'll basically produce a concept map with a whole bunch of different ideas, like this is a reason for that and that's a reason for that. The important thing is actually get students to see the relationship between reasons, so how reasons, you know, collectively support um, a particular conclusion and importantly to be able to distinguish between sub-arguments which are distinct arguments for the same conclusion. Okay, um, so just uh, quickly, uh, because I know I'm running out of time, I just want to say a few things about the UQ Critical Thinking Project. It's framed around um, uh, empowering marginalised students. I mean, we've, we've started off and it's still our main focus is to assist uh, students um, and teachers from low SES um, schools or schools with high numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander remote and rural students. And in pursuing this pro program, we um, uh, engage in professional development. We have a collaboration with the Impact Centre called Aspiring Thinkers. And I see Glenn Watt, the director of the Impact Centre up the back. Way, Glenn, there he is. <laughs> um, and these are the kinds of resources we provide for teachers who undertake that um, training. And we can also do that, that training as well um, at every level, you know, primary, secondary, and also uh, at university level. So the Impact Centre will also offer, um, also offers critical thinking classes to students, and I'll show you where they offer critical thinking classes um, to students. So it's an online delivery based here in Brisbane. Um, but you can see that it has statewide reach in over 300 schools um, participating in these online critical thinking extension classes, including way up in the Torres Strait. I always say that there are students on an island from which you can walk to Papua New Guinea at low tide taking critical thinking. Another one of our partners is Cavendish Road State High School's Academy of Ideas, and they have a project to embed uh, philosophy and critical thinking P to 12 with five neighbouring schools. And there's Adam Cuss, the director of that project, director of teaching and learning at Cavendish Road there. And there they are being written up in the Courier Mail for bucking a national trend of declining in performance um, through their philosophy program. And the final um, project I wanted to mention in the social inclusion space is um, a wonderful partnership that's been going with the Department of Education since 2012 called Solid Pathways, which is for high performing <coughs> Indigenous students, the aim of which is to keep them on track to a university uh, enrolment. Is it working? Um, here's some lovely data. This is the Impact Centre data on relative gains on NAPLAN reading. So the students in the critical thinking program are the green line relative to all other students who were at the same um, performance level on the previous NAPLAN. Writing and numeracy. Mm, too fast. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that critical thinking has that impact across so many areas, writing, reading, and also numeracy. Cavendish Road has similar um, effect sizes showing the uh, importance of critical thinking, the, um, the benefits of critical thinking. 
across the curriculum. Um, these are the uh, relative gains on NAPLAN and numeracy, reading, but also Cavendish Road's got some really nice data on academic performance. So students essentially, what we're seeing from both the impact data and also the Cavendish Road data is students moving up one performance band um, much more frequently than the controls. And Cavendish Road's also got some lovely data as well on behavioural results, both improvements in students' learning behaviour and also their social behaviours as well. I can't show you the data from the Solid Pathways project because it's, um, it's still being uh, calculated, but we are seeing that programs like Solid Pathways are closing the gap for Indigenous students. So this is the performance from 2008 to 2017 on QCE, on QCE completions. And you can see that as of 2017, there was a negligible gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous students in terms of QCE completions. And in a report table to the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Indigenous Affairs, this was linked to the kind of investment that the Department of Education has made on projects like Solid Pathways. And Solid Pathways students, like the Impact Centre students, receive a one hour a week uh, online critical thinking class and also have extensive opportunities for university engagement. And they are thriving. There's going to be by the, they're aiming to have about a thousand students enrolled by the end of this year. Uh, but each year we're talking about, you know, five to six hundred students at least in the program. Sometimes it's been eight hundred students. So these are significant gains for Indigenous students just through a one hour a week critical thinking program. Uh, I won't read this because I'm out of time, but there's some great quotes here. Um, I will make one reference to this one. I love this quote uh, from a student at Mansfield College, uh, Mansfield State High School, who said, I definitely have found that my confidence, even when talking to relatives, has increased. <laughs> so, uh, ancillary benefits. <laughs> and also teachers um, say some nice things. Glenn, did you want to say something? We've had two students successfully argue to buy a horse themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, if you want to... if you, so you kids here, if you want a pony, <laughs> see me later, all right? <laughs> and the teacher feedback has been extraordinary as well. Teachers are hungry for exactly this kind of pedagogy um, because it's, you know, it's timely and it's important. So anyway, so that's it from me. Uh, this is us. This is my team, <laughs> most of whom are down here. Um, and uh, next, thank you. <laughs>